Welcome to the Attuned to You Podcast. I am Ash Marshall O'Dell, spiritual teacher and mentor, healer, intuitive, medium, empath, shaman, Reiki master and teacher, meditation facilitator, crystal therapist, master's degree teacher, and author of the book, Lightbound, a healer's journey through trauma, CPTSD, and anxiety. In season two of the Attuned to You Podcast, we delve into connections as new guests share stories, skills, and tools to help you tune into possibilities for self-empowerment, growth, and adventure. Welcome to the Attuned You Podcast. I'm Ash Marshall O'Dell, and today I am joined with Erica Ironwood of Craft and Cauldron. Welcome, Erica. Thanks. So, I'm really happy to be here. I'm so glad you were able to join me for this talk. I'm super curious. How did you become a Wildcraft teacher? And can you actually sort of define that for the audience? Well, um, I think that. Let's see, how did I become a wildcraft teacher? Um, I, th I think of myself more like a, well, a wildcraft or foraging doula. I'm over here to give people the impression that anyone can do this and that it's not, um, don't let it be intimidating. Don't let it be overwhelming. Um, you don't have to be an herbalist in order to take advantage of the abundance in the woods. You don't have to be um, you don't have to have ancestral knowledge, although that is really cool. And I wish that I had had that, um, you know, in order to bridge this space between um, when we all used to know this information and and the way we've so heavily relied on or been told we need to heavily rely on the medical establishment for the last many generations to reclaim that knowledge for ourselves it doesn't require that you um, coming from someone that has always struggled with imposter syndrome. It isn't easy to give yourself permission to to know enough to go and get food out of the wild places or even in the urban areas that you know is safe and apply it to your meals and apply it to your your own little dresser of apothecary goodness that you gather. You don't have to have a certificate. Although if you can afford to take classes, we live in a brilliant time in history where you can take classes on this, you know, if you can afford it. But if you can't afford it, you know, we hold the world in our hands. It's a phenomenal time to be alive. We have anything you need, you know, get yourself a couple of plant identification apps. Sorry, I'm way ahead of myself. <laughs> I started out when we had um, Yellow Pages and the library and, um, you, <laughs> needed, you know, you needed to find, and if you couldn't find someone they could teach you, you were going to have to teach yourself. And um, how did I become a foraging guide? Uh, that was, I didn't, I certainly didn't choose it. I'm not a, I'm not a, um, that wasn't my plan. I didn't think, you know, I wonder if I could, you know, get figure this out, how to become a teacher. I was sort of pulled into it by um, my enthusiasm for the plants is kind of contagious. When I would go out with people, I'd be at a barbecue and they're like, come look at our new place structure. And on the way out there, I'm like, ooh, look at this. You have all this stuff growing on your in your garden and your roses. This is food. This is medicine. And, you know, I just couldn't help myself. You know, like I'm telling people everywhere I go, I'm at the play group. Hey, look at this stuff growing in this community garden next to your play situation. This is all food and they're yanking it out. Can, I'd ask, hey, can we take this? Like, can I take this home and make medicine out of this? And we'd be on a hike or like a two or three or four day uh, camping trip, backpacking trip. And the whole time I'm like, oh, look, let's take this with us in case we get hurt, in case we get sick, in case one of us, you know, I mean, just everywhere I went, I was contagiously, uh, not contagiously, infectiously uh sharing this with people and so before long folks said hey um you remember when we were at the thing and you were talking about the stuff can we like go on another hike so you can show my sister or my friend or my husband or whatever he would really like to know about that so it sort of gained momentum because my enthusiasm was met with a response where people just really wanted this information and i didn't i didn't um i didn't even it didn't occur to me to call myself a guide or a teacher for a long time because again the imposter syndrome I thought you needed to have whatever those qualifications were um and I also didn't feel like it was fair to charge people for what I think belongs to all of us so you know some very good friends and colleagues and my partner worked hard to convince me that that this expertise could be a business and that was a big hump for me because I feel like this belongs to all of us but I like to think that as a foraging doula, that I can bring people out to the woods and demystify what is what is here for them and show them that it grows everywhere they go, different different um, little microclimates, different bioregions, 
And I'm learning out there too. 19 years later, every time I'm out, it seems like I see something at a different time of year. And, oh, I didn't realize that's what that looked like this time of year. You're like, I don't know what that plan is. Let's learn together. Let's get out our apps. Let's get out our books. Let's go on the Google. You know, let's verify, verify, verify. That's kind of my very unsexy way of, of taglining my practice. <laughs> verify, verify, verify. Verify the heck out of things. Right. Anyway, I didn't, I didn't mean to become a guide, but by popular demand and my enthusiasm, it just became a, a pull toward that. And then because I was sharing this with people and they were asking me a lot of questions, it forced me to delve a lot more into it, you know? And so I sort of, by the impetus of or the, you know, the momentum, my personal walk with the plants became deeper and deeper because I felt like I needed to know they're asking me things and I want to know too. And so anyway, it, it was never, it was never my plan, but here I am. And you've grown so much because I remember you yeah. told me your story. I would love if you would share that with the viewers and listeners about the Oregon oh. grape and how yeah, that yeah. sort of opened it up for you. Yeah. So growing up um, super poor and super um, usually pretty rural, uh, there was no, um, you know, I, I knew a lot about primitive backroads medicine, but um if you got really sick, like an infection or a broken leg, you still had to go into the hospital. And so as a 19 year old with impacted wisdom teeth, I was forced to go into the urgent care, no insurance at the time, go into the urgent care and get antibiotics because I couldn't afford to have my teeth pulled. And I definitely didn't know enough about um, wild medicine then to know, to be empowered in that way. So I went, I, I went and got prescription antibiotics two or three times and I didn't, like this. I knew enough by then to know that this was bad for my body and not sustainable. And I knew it was a long road ahead before I could get my teeth pulled. So I saved enough money to go to a naturopath, which I was super fascinated with at that by that time. And she gave me some Oregon grape and some green clay and said to make a paste and I put it in a gauze and just hold it in my mouth three or three times a day for 20 minutes or so. And it worked and it worked brilliantly. And I ran out within four or five months and I thought, well, I can't afford to go back and get more from her. So now what? Well, I pulled out the yellow pages and I found an herbal store in town and I went down um, limbos. They've closed since years and years ago, but I walked in and I saw this wall of jars, you know, like a hallway of jars. And I was just blown away. What? Okay. Um, you know, I found Oregon grape, but I saw uh, quite a few other herbs that I recognized by name if not by use, and um, still didn't know that many of those grew near me at this point. But I was like, whoa, what else don't I know? So it it became, wait, if that is, um, I know that plant, and this is what it looks like in, in gathered and dried form. Okay, so like, it just kind of blew up. It was a revelation. I experienced sort of a, um, you know, I was just like, back to the library we go. I want books on this um this whole situation, more books, more, you know, uh, anyway, that was, that was the beginning. Oregon grape was the beginning of uh, discovering that you could get potently uh, antiviral, antibacterial, anti um, microbial medicine in like root form, bark form, plant form that doesn't, doesn't come from a, in a pill or from a doctor. So that was mind blowing, you know, and, and there are many, 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 like many, not just Oregon grape, which is a phenomenal um, ally all around us, but there are many other amazing plants that grow in our yards and in our recreational areas and in our, uh, any, you know, anyway. <laughs> the herbs that we just grow for what we consider. Yes. Culinary culinary use. Uh, m many, many, many of those herbs that we grow for culinary use are similar. Yeah. I mean, those uh, rosemary, thyme, oregano, um, brain um sumac tarragon yeah basil, all of that yeah, yeah. amazing they have um, way more uses than than like turkey soup um there's a reason they're in turkey soup <laughs> i mean besides that, they, that the flavor you know like sage that's why that's why i was frustrated sage how can you forget sage but the uses for sage are far exceeding you know thanksgiving dressing like i grew up i mean and i didn't have a lot of support in this in this exploration like no elders or relatives that were gung-ho about this or even very like excited about it um so uh 
I mean, I had some friends, some friends that lived in 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 areas of Portland that were into it, and because those were the kind of neighborhoods we would find. But I was out here in the in the burbs where everybody, you know, this wasn't it was it was a weird thing to be doing and being into in the '90s and in the early aughts. Not really. There has been people doing this all over the country. Pioneers, you know, Rosemary Gladstar, Susan Weed, have some mixed feelings about the latter, but. Um, people that know their stuff and have for, you know, been, been preaching this or teaching this or whatever forever, um, you know, and now it's, you know, now foraging is huge on all the um, site TikTok. I mean, uh, Alexis Nicole, Black Forager, you know, she's on all the major news networks now and she should be. She's phenomenal. And I follow her. And, and there are so many awesome content creators that do what I do. I'm not totally interested in that. <laughs> I would rather remain um, a field, what I call a field practitioner. I don't want to make videos. I want to invite people out and spend time in the woods because really, 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 that's my church. That's my home. That's where I belong is out in the woods. So, you know, getting people out there because it's not just medicine and food. It's like forest bathing. Mm -hmm. We all have heard about this, right? The benefits of forest bathing. Even if you don't find anything you feel comfortable harvesting and using, you're going to benefit from foraging. Oh Even if you don't have, you know what I mean? Even if your basket comes back empty, you're going to have movement beyond your normal routine. You're going to can't, you're not going to be able to help leaving the the paved path. You're going to be uppy downy up on the, you know, you're going to be using your hips and you're, and you're going to be using your body in like the ways we did when we were 12. And it's going to feel really invigorating if you don't get poison oak. <laughs> that um, is not pleasant <laughs> no and you're gonna get infusions you cannot help you cannot avoid being surprised and feeling a sense of wonder you know whether or not you're taking children and I go out with children all the time not just my own but like all these groups of kids and the kids get it real quick they get how cool this is real quick it is amazing and just by going out into the forest um, you're really activating different areas of the brain sides yeah sounds, smells, and you get familiar with areas that you wouldn't have gotten familiar with. You know, you'll be, you, you look on the, you'll, you'll look on the, like the Google maps and you're like, where can we walk to or bike to near here where there's some like green on the map? Oh, look, I didn't know there was a whole area near where we live. Let's go explore that and go foraging there. And people discover, um, they discover a relationship with the land and the earth. Well, obviously and the earth, um, it seeds consideration for and passion for and connection with the environments around you even in an urban environment you know i live deeply urban i live in a problematic area of town but i also can walk to 600 acres of forest at pal butte so you know i'm very blessed in that way some folks live um you know nowhere near a wild place and that's and that's hard. And that's one of my, if I'm evangelical about this at all, which I'm really not, but if I am, if I have like a, um, an, a motive, one of my motives, I guess, if, if you call it that, is that I want to get this information to people that think that they don't, that they, that it doesn't apply to them. They live an apartment life. Well, I don't have a garden. I don't have wild spaces. I don't have a yard. I don't have people that I don't even have friends who own, own land. You know, that's most of us where I live. And I would like them to see how much land they actually have and how much access they actually have and how, um, how apartment life is very difficult, very, very difficult in many ways, um, especially for this certain socioeconomic circumstances. And those folks, my, my folks have been, um, disenfranchised and they have, they, they don't feel like they have any agency in their health and their wellness and, you know, they're living, paycheck to paycheck or worse, if they thought they could just go for a walk or a drive and gather enough food to make that little bit of what they have stretch a little further and bonus, the stuff you're going to find is going to be a lot more potently nourishing than what you find in the store, which is kind of like a life hack. When you discover that these weeds and these plants that are all over the place, I mean, okay, well, let me back up. You need to make sure that where you're gathering is safe yes, because it's not always even when you see weeds four months ago, they were maybe spraying right there. So it's helpful to visit a place more in more than one season to see kind of what's going on. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, well, where do you think I can, I live in an apartment, you know, I'm happy to drive wherever, bike wherever, but where do you think I should go? Um, 
do you know anybody at church that owns land? Ask them if you can come forward to their land. Do you have a grandpa, an uncle, a neighbor? You know, I mean, make inroads, you know, say, hey, I'm learning about this. Would you mind if I came and grow, saw, you know, look and see if I can find some plants on your land? I mean, you'd be surprised. People might be like, yeah, that's quirky, but sure. Come on out. Come take a look. And then you go home with like a lot of awesome medicine. Yeah. And you know it's safe because you can find out from the person that owns the land parks in in recreational areas aren't always honest about what they're spraying sometimes you can tell sometimes you can't so do your research please <laughs> that's important right because yeah you want to put clean things into your body it yeah does a lot of work on your behalf and you don't want to have to make it work harder you want to support yeah. your body no. right right but if you're going to give this to your your elders and your children and yourself and you're going to try here you are thinking, oh, I read that I can use this for my sleep. I can I can go forward to this for my restlessness, for my leg cramps, for my, um, I can have an on-hand expectorant. I can have a styptic. I can have a nervine. I can have an antiviral um, friend, ally, yes. wild plant, you know? Okay, but yes, but you're going to need to make sure, I mean, sorry, I'm getting excited. You got to make sure it's the right time of year for that part of the plant. What part of the plant? What time of year? Because, yeah, it might work a little, but it'll work a lot better if you get it during the right season and the right part of the plant. Because you want potent. Yes. And um, some parts of the plant are toxic. So don't just read one one thing. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. I'll go get out some elder. Elder is great. I think elder sounds like a miracle. The leaves are toxic. So read, you know, I just have to emphasize and emphasize. Do your research. Verify, verify. Just, get, you know, it's exciting. Get excited. But Which don't. is why it's good for people to come do a walk with a qualified yeah. professional so yeah. that they get all parts of this type of information and have a nice checklist. So when they do decide to go on their own, yeah, there is. And I'm going to apologize to all our viewers and listeners. I have a cat, an elderly cat, who is quite determined to come visit right now. So I apologize for the meowing and the scratching. <laughs> I love it. I have, I arranged a rare um space of I have a I have a happy circus here at the home as well but they're not here right now <laughs> that's helpful isn't it yes oh my goodness yes so getting back to plants um yeah I can tell I was going to ask you what your driving passion is but that just came through so beautifully <laughs> it's exciting to listen to you talk about this because truly we are so conditioned to go to the grocery store for our food and to the western medical doctor to get any type of uh, medicinal uh, supplements or just treatments yeah. and yet all over the world in every place you go there is so much already there in fact you know most of the pharmacological um, agents that we can buy are plant-based or were based or were originally yeah before exactly. they were made synthetically exactly right i mean i i, I think it's um uh, such an empowering thing for people to go out yeah. and gather and learn and do for themselves. And yeah. I think, as you've said, we've forgotten a lot of that because in my grandmother's time, even there were what they called old fashioned or old timey remedies. Yeah. And, and it's been discouraged. It, it has. And I can understand from some standpoints, because as you say, if you are not well informed, you can cause some detrimental harm to yourself you know like yeah. it, you can do some and I, damage and i am a um scientific yes you are person. i'm a scientific person i'm 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 teaching practical uses i'm only about a two out of ten on the woo scale when i'm in the field because that's not what i'm here to teach i want um i will never say that antibiotics are no bueno. I'm enormously thankful for all the medical technology, the testing we have, the um, the prescriptions we have. Um, if you, your brain doesn't have what it takes uh, when you wake up, um, store-bought brain is fine. Like give yourself what you need. I'm a huge fan of what a miracle modern medicine is. But if your um, experiences with pharmaceuticals have been problematic, maybe some of these plants are a better holistic answer. Um, but holistic medicine and alternative medicine has been, it's still uh, received with, um, well, it still gets a hostile reception or, or indifference, right? It doesn't, it doesn't get the, um, 
it doesn't get a fair shake most of the time. It's but true. I also I also think that there's a place for pharmaceuticals and 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 when people ask me, which happens frequently many times a week, hey, what do you want? I'm, this is my condition. This is my battle. This is what I'm dealing with, whether it's physical health, mental health, temporary, whatever. Um, you know, I can't offer people um, guidance and specific help. Like here, here, take this tincture. Here, take this tea, the same tea um, infusion. Here's the herbs that will help you before first discussing what kind of pharmaceuticals are you taking already? Because these are not always, this is not, it's not always compatible. Sometimes it's fine, but you want to be doing a lot of research and checking with your practitioner to make sure that these herbs are going to be compatible because many of them are not. Also, these herbs, these allies can only help so much. I always tell people, okay, what about your sleep? What about your nutrition? What about moving your body? What about touch? Not the touch that somebody else thinks you need, but the touch that you need. What about hobbies? Are you spending all your time um, not creating anything? Are you, um, what about community? Are you reaching out to people or are you stuck? Are you, are you, you know, we're going to hold down. What about time in nature? So these seven things, nature, community, hobbies, touch, nutrition, movement, sleep. Some of us are struggling and we're, we're getting by on like two of those. We have new moms with th three kids under five. We have people that just lost their parents, their house, and they're going through a divorce. We have people that lost their job at 26 years and also their health is in decline. Some people are lucky if they can get five, get one of those things per day. So the herbs will help in that case. And they'll, they help us regardless and always, but I can't solve that you won't get that you won't put your, you know, put your phone away and get some, some rest. I can't, the herbs won't meet you where you're at if you don't um, cover your bases. And if that's impossible, then the herbs are amazing. But, you know, anyway, you didn't ask me about no, life. No. I appreciate you sharing that because herbs are in plant, plant medicine and just food, nutrition are huge contributors, yeah. but we are, as you've said, very complex people and there are many many factors that go into creating a healthy body and to get all of the self into balance in all ways is really difficult as you just shared with and me we go through people. chapters where we can't achieve balance because we can't right. and so the herbs herbs plants these wild foods will absolutely get us through that period and they have saved me through grief, through the postpartum, through injury, through, um, you know, through uh, the, the turbulence of my own humanity and everyone that I love, practically everyone. <laughs> I can't think of, I, you know. It's true. I mean, my daughter, when she was very little, we went to visit my family back in the Carolinas and she was bitten by mosquitoes and she had the most horrific reactions. She had, it was like a hard rock in her leg. Um, she had water blisters that formed streaks Whoa. and an infection from the mosquitoes and so we ended up in urgent care and it took quite a bit of time for this to fully clear it was very bizarre it was very and so i was determined to not happen again but i refused to use deet on my child which is what was yeah. available commercially so you know yeah. research cloves whole cloves in 150 milliliters of alcohol, 15 cloves, shake it three yeah. times a day, add a couple teaspoons of olive oil, 98 to 99% effective. And you smell like a cookie. What is not to love, right? So there's so <laughs> yeah. much that plants offer. I mean, and even beyond that, there's so many uses that you talked about earlier, like cloves help with toothaches. Yeah. Um, yeah, just when you start delving into wool that is available, within the plant kingdom it's yeah mind boggling and the fact that you teach this and you leave people not only just for knowledge but an experience because you offer a whole experience so i would love for you to talk about not only the foraging aspect but you do more than that you bring people yeah. into and teach them how to prepare so i would love for you to talk about that as well um i just want to uh my so i do intro foraging walks i take people out and we um we uh we go from plant to plant to plant and we see how many we can find that i recognize or maybe that they recognize and we talk about ways that i've used them and 
how I put them to use, whether I make, you know, oil infusions or, um, or tinctures or what other menstruums I use, or whether I make an oxymel, which is uh, phenomenal, by the way, vinegar and honey, put a bunch of herbs in there, let it sit for a while. You can put this, sorry, it's really hot in here. Um, if you put that on salad, you can use it as part of a dip. Um, you can just drink it. So many of us make a um, fire cider, which involves honey and vinegar and a bunch of potently spicy, excellent immune boosting stuff. Um, it's brilliant. And uh, there's just a ton of ways that I want to encourage people. to. So we're out in the field and I'm like, oh, look at this. We could harvest this and we could make this, this, this and this. And anyway, on to the next plant. And they call it this and it has 15 other names and and this is how you check this is how you tell what it is and and um and we i pull out the phone app and i show them how to confirm and then you know you take a picture of the plant yep the app says that that, that the app thinks that's what it is okay then let's go to google and it will search for that plant does that also because the app isn't always right technology is not any more guaranteed to be right than than we are so verify, verify, verify what does the app say what does the google say and then get out your book if you have one check the book because chances are the book did not publish inaccurate information, but you don't always have the book with you. So you make sure, but I teach people how simple it is to get out there and learn the plants, recognize them, maybe harvest some, but please never harvest what you don't either know how to use or don't have time to use. People get excited, they harvest a bunch of plant, and then they go home and they remember, oh, I have to go take care of that thing tomorrow, and then we're leaving town, and now they've wasted all this plant that they didn't need, you know what I mean? And the least we can do when we're out there besides sing them a song give them some water thank the plants tell the plants our purpose maybe even ask their permission before we take them but past that we could not waste them and we could consider what other plants and animals and the what, what the land and the other occupants of the land have to say about does that you know anyway that's a that's a whole other talk about what we would know about this companion growing and companion space sharing of the plants. It's true because it's all interconnected in the forest. Yeah. Plants emit chemicals that um, help other plants to grow or attract pollinators. And if you change one thing yeah. in the environment, you change all things in the environment. And if we all go out there and take a little, then there's none left. And so you got to consider how many people have access to the space. You know, how harmed does it look? How how strong? How how established is this situation? A lot of things to consider when you forage. There are many plants, don't get me wrong, there are many plants that would be, you'd be hard pressed to over harvest like dandelion, plantain, self-heal. Um, however, use the heck out of your invasives. That's a whole other talk as well. How many invasives, we invasive plants that we can use in abundance for food and medicine. There are many other practitioners in my area that teach um, super immersive classes about that. Uh, you were asking me about what I offer besides foraging walks. The intro walks and then i offer these immersive classes where we hang out all day or for like four or five hours instead of just doing plant id for an hour or two and then hey you know what good luck text me if you need any help with a plant you find you know <laughs> good luck and then we move on with our day i also have people come with me and we do the same thing we id plants and we walk around and discuss them but then we gather some whenever we find some that seem appropriate to gather and then we go and we make food and medicine with them. And I show people kind of how super simple that looks and how to, um, and we talk a lot about, uh, you know, now I've made a tincture. What, what, how do I, what kind of dose, it, you know, what kind of dose would I take of this? You know, what kind of, if I, now I've made this infusion of oil, what do I do now? Like, do I just like put it on myself? Like, and I talk about how to make a salve. I talk about, I mean, it's just super intro level stuff. But it's that it's that leap, you know, it's demystifying, um, you know, you don't have to. I mean, if you can go take a week or two or a year long course, do it. I wish I could have done it. You know, I've had to piece this together like a crazy quilt over the last 19 years. And I finally gave myself permission. You know, when people would reach out to me and ask me what they could do about whatever they need and whatever they're dealing with, and I would pull out my books and I would see that. Um, Either I already knew what they were dealing with and what I would refer, what I would share with them, or my books would, I, I already have these things in my apothecary. I have these things that are, oh, I'll put together a thing for them and give it to them. It was a long time before I realized that I had arrived. You know, like everything in these books, I know how to grow or find. You know, I went from ordering from 
mountain rose and other mountain mountain mouse and other local you know um 12 13 years ago i was still ordering 50 or 75 percent because i still didn't feel like i trusted myself and i didn't you know but three or four years ago i realized i don't know i i don't have a certificate in this but i definitely feel like i should give myself permission to teach people what i know so i did and honestly, if you get the chance to look at her Facebook page, some of the dishes that she posts, those pictures, I asked her actually to adopt me at one point. So I can <laughs> just come eat dinner. It looks amazing. And it's things right. that you gathered and you teach people how to create these types of dishes and also these herbs. And I know that you started out, I remember you telling me this, with a dresser drawer. Yeah. And then you First just- with two drawers and a dresser two drawers in a dresser with mason jars and baggies and whatever that I, you know, would go to. And then it became a bookshelf of jars and bags and things. And then it became two bookshelves. And then when I bought my, we bought our second house about three years ago, um, you know, three apartment transitions and two house transitions. And finally I have my office, which is this room that my husband built me with um, enough space for my work, uh, all the jars and jars of things. It's a, I'm going to have to overflow into the library. <laughs> <for long. laughs> what an amazing thing to have at your fingertips always to do that. So yeah, it, it, feels, it, feels, it feels vulgar to, to brag about it. Cause I know that most people don't have that kind of space and that kind of, um, you know, you know I, I will, I will say that we can create, we, we have far more little nooks and crannies than we often think about. So I think, you know, if you are passionate about it and, and you find that it really resonates with you, you, you can find, you can find some ways to get things in there. You know, I've yeah. seen actually people take out their drywall and create yeah. themselves. And make like a built-in. Yeah. That's exactly. a great idea. Right. Yeah. Or like half of your pantry or whatever. I mean, yeah, people get innovative and I love when people invite me to their place to show them what grows on their land. Um, and then like a few years later, they invite me back to show me where, where they've, where they've started to create an apothecary. And like one woman used this um, roll top desk that had the old, uh, all the mail shelves, like shelves and shelves and shelves above the, and they were all full of herbs. And yeah, anyway, so good. It is so good. And it's just, it's super simple. Yeah. Things to do for yourself and your family to yeah. just add an extra layer of nurturing and care. To yeah, you. and honestly, in many many ways, it's far less expensive than commercial products. So oh yeah, oh yeah, it. and it's and it's it's um, you buy a small bottle. Let me see if I got a. You buy a small bottle of tincture online, and it's going to be. I mean, because to be fair, it costs them time and money and the supplies and all this stuff. Um, you know what it costs? You're going to pay thirty six dollars for. Um, a small portion of tincture when you could for half that you can make a year's worth of tincture you know so it and then you'll be so stoked by how much you've made that you want to give it away to all the people and then eventually you have to remember to ask because you give away so many jars and, and the vodka that you use to make the tinctures <laughs> and, the, and the supplies to make the salve and eventually thankfully people will usually say you know can I can I give you something because you've been you know Thankfully, your people will look after you, but you can't help it. You wanted to share all these things that you found and made and yeah. It feels good, right? Yeah. Seriously. No, I, I hear you. I mean, it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, but once you learn the yeah. basics of how to do it, you're set and you can just yeah. know, which is exactly what you've and done. And they last so long. Like the teas are a little bit lower. Uh, you know, you got to use the teas sooner. The salve, you know, two or three or four years, but the tinctures will literally last so long, so long, 10 plus years in some cases. Um, so once you've made a, um, you know, and some of these things, well, anyway, I don't need to start going into what they do. <laughs> uh, but some of these things, they grow every spring or they grow every whatever season and you can use them every day and nourish your bodies and you can know that you're not going to have to make enough to last years and years. But some of them you can make sweet, you know, you can make a sweet gum tincture that'll last you five or six years. You don't have to go out and try to find sweet gum pods very often because you're not going to need it very often. But you have it when you need it, which is yeah. brilliant. Because sometimes yeah. when you need something, you just need it. <laughs> yeah. And you'll and another and you'll find that a lot of the plants that have been over harvested 
uh, that we don't want to be out there gathering and we want to be respectful about that, there are all kinds of alternative plants that do very similar things. And so I'm a fan of introducing people to those as well. Yes, because plants have so much crossover in the different things that they are able to help you with. Yeah. So, I mean, literally like three plants can all be treatments for the same sort of issue you might experience. Yeah. yeah. And one of them may not uh, work for work you. For and me. one of them, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever tried like willow. My, I used to have to rely on other um, like ibuprofen and things for certain injuries or, or conditions. And I, my body responds so, so, so much more to willow. I haven't had to use um, any of that over the counter business for a long time. Feels like. And it's just so much easier to have your own sort of store and just in many ways, gentler on your body without the same necessary side effects that you might encounter with certain commercial products. Absolutely. So I find really the only and really the only um, drawback or, or um, con, pros and cons, the only con would be that you're um, going to have to stop your people before they go out and have the landscaper or the, the before they before your kids go out and mow the lawn. You're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And you're out there crawling around on your hands and he's harvesting all these weeds and all these things growing in the places so that you can use them. OK, now you can go. Now you can go weed and edge and lawnmower and everybody's looking at you like, really? <laughs> but they know eventually they get used to it um and and other than that i mean and a place to keep all these jars and baggies of excellence in the dark if you can help it yes yes because you definitely want them um in a cool dry dark location tightly sealed yeah. if you can just to and there, preserve and there really are so many variables i mean the human the human body like what works for me may not work for you. Exactly. So don't take my word for it. Don't take the book's word for it. Don't take the internet's word for it. Um, do you know? It Try may take a tiny bit. You know, yeah. like if you. So, if I have something that I want to try on my skin, I might take like the tiniest drop and touch it to my skin. Yeah. And if you don't get a reaction there, then you could try a little bit more. And also, different parts of the body, like the skin, is finer or more sensitive so even though you may not have any reaction on your hand if you were to put it on say your stomach or something or you like on your panel your panel is a really sensitive spot your neck um i don't recommend that because you know <laughs> but I, I i tend to be like okay it didn't react with my arm i'm going to try it something more sensitive don't try your eyelid um oh, also, no. <laughs> <laughs> um i think that uh you know, it's a lot of, it's, I don't want to say it's a lot of experimentation because that makes it sound precarious. Um, uh, but it goes, it, it goes beautifully and it's astonishing. Oh, the drop, uh, drop testing, like mm -hmm. um, what you were saying about testing the X outside. Sometimes you can put a little plant, a little tea, a little tincture, and you can, you can tell that that's what your body needs or not, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like when you look at someone's body language or, um, I mean, there's other ways, there's lots of things we do on a daily basis that we don't think about where we just know, we know, nah, I don't, I don't want any more coffee today. My body's saying no, yes. you know, um, just because this, this particular tincture is supposed to help me sleep or it's supposed to help me with nerves or whatever, mm, you know, listen to your body. I mean, listen to your body, but that's hard. There's a lot of static. We're very busy. We have busy lives. We are tired. We have people asking us something every 15 seconds. Um, it's hard to find time to listen to your body. And, and thankfully some of these plants will help with that too. They'll help you be more attuned <laughs> to use one of your favorite words. <laughs> yes, I know. I love, I love it. It's so, it's such a strange word. People are like, um, what does that even mean? You know, to become yeah. conscious or aware of things and, and body awareness is a huge factor when it comes to uh, taking care of yourself and knowing what works for you and what doesn't. And you can truly just, even with, a tincture or whatever, just, or an herb, just literally touch it to your tongue. And if you get like a, ah, you know, that might be a really good indicator right there, or, you know, a drop under your tongue and uh, some people get nauseated or there's a taste of pennies or, you know, other, like there's so many different indicators, or if you smell something and like you're immediately nauseous, that might be a good idea not to drink or that. Find yourself, or you're like, I want to drink this whole bottle. Yes. You know, like now that tastes so good. And then you're, then maybe you should have some of that a couple times a day, you know? 
Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know if that's always true. I'm saying you should also check and see if this, if this, uh, if this um, particular plan is compatible with the prescriptions you're taking or whatever, you know, or, you know, and what feels good today in three days, it might feel not as amazing. Some plants you're not supposed to take and enjoy for more than a short time. Right. You know, they can be really beneficial and then detrimental in like a longer course of, you know, so do your research, please. Yes. And teachers <laughs> are so potent that just, you know, it's drop or four or a microdose, like two drops, you know, maybe yeah. you're taking it for a week or two for stomach or, you know, you're just clearing something out of your body. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be a lot to be highly effective when it comes to plant. Yeah, that's uh, true. So, but foraging will, um, it'll change your life in, in incremental, exponential, substantial ways. And sometimes ways you don't even predict. And it'll change the lives of the people around you by normalizing the agency it gives people and the, and the completely excellent use of our abundance that it is in completely, um, like simple ways you know you can get your kids to i promise you can get your kids to eat dandelions numerous times a week and they won't care because there's many ways to prepare them that are super delicious you know but don't eat them raw i've had people text me from other parts of the country or other parts of the world and say girl what are you talking about this is terrible well they're not sorrel they're not you know <laughs> they're, <Yes>. they're not kale <laughs> No, they're not. I tried them as salad and I even use like they, you know, when it's bitter, you put like a fat. I'm not a big fat type person, but I put a, a fattier type dressing and I was yeah. like, mm, I can't, I, I can't do this. <laughs> well, I mean, I jokingly, but not really joking, tell people if you're going to go out in the world for a long day hike or a backpacking trip, or you're going to go in unknown territory and you might get lost, do take the time to take some fat with you because that a little extra weight in your backpack the difference between i mean so the bears take all your food or your food gets falls out of the raft and now you have no food the difference between surviving on wild food without fat versus having a little bit of fat all the difference in the world you know saute those dandelions like you know how you get crispy basil at the thai food store thai food store thai food restaurant Make crispy dandelion or crispy dock or crispy plantain and throw that on your stir fry. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not an advocate of a lot of fat either, but good fat, you know, yes. good source fat, excellent fat, um, good for you. And everything tastes better with fat. Fat is flavor and it's good for the body in moderation. Yes. And a lot of these plants are delicious, uh, but not necessarily raw. But there are so many plants that are delicious raw. Yes, and you made this phenomenal. And I never tried this. I've only ever read about it in Fairy Tale and Dandelion One. I was able to sample some at that event that I met you. And yeah. I could just literally feel the sensations of it in my body because it's a strong liver clearer. So yeah. it was phenomenal. And it tasted so good. It was so yeah. funny. Thank yeah, the know. mountain, the mountain folk used to make a lot of different things out of dandelion because it will sustain you through the long winter in the mountains and um on the ships they would keep dandelion and sometimes toss folks overboard if they had too much weight because the dandelions will stave off scurvy and offer so many other micronutrient benefits you know what i mean I dandelions have a rich and 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 not always shiny history with their the way people you know what i mean but in other countries, they treat dandelion like we treat kale. That's and amazing. anyway, you don't click on my dandelion icon. <laughs> I'll be here all day. Anyone who really knows will. me knows. Anyone yeah. who knows me knows that. But I could do that about many, many, many plans. Let me tell you, like, there, yeah, save them, make things of them, set them aside. Dandelion mead, great example. You could feel it. This year, I made uh, linden mead for the first time. Yeah. Linden, yeah, linden flower mead. That was delicious. And it's very soothing and calming and has a lot of um yeah, anyway. They're all there's so many ways to use these plants and it doesn't take very much effort, just space and time. And uh and that time that you spend gathering them and creating goodness for your people is so nurturing um in other ways, in so many ways. You're empowered and yeah. 
you're taking some time away from technology and the business of your life. Yeah. <laughs> just be present with yourself yeah. to do something yeah. that feels good. Not only yeah. in the present moment, but in future, as you look at what you have created. Absolutely. So, yes. Yep. Oh, so much goodness. Erica, I am so thankful to you for joining me and giving us this wonderful talk about wildcrafting. And if people would like to get in touch with you to put together a walk or to do the immersion portion of, which I highly recommend to everyone, you can reach her at Craft and Cauldron. And I will leave links to all of her contact information and social media in the description. So thank you again. For yeah, thanks for fun. Yeah, you bet. Have a great week.